Dr. Robertson has published widely on the political economy of, educate, of the education sector, from the global to the regional, local, and individual. Her approach to the study of globalization and education has been formed out of working as an academic in different parts of the world, including Australia, Canada, and New Zealand since 1999, and as a professor of sociology of education. Dr. Robertson also has served as a senior policy advisor to the European Commission and is an advisor to the Open Society Institute Soros Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Robertson as she delivers the plenary address confronting contradictions of globalization for science education and educators. Dr. Susan Robertson. Thank you very much, uh, Lynn, and uh, thank you particularly to the uh, organisers of this uh, great event. Um, and it's, it's a really, truly great pleasure to be with you here at your annual NAST conference in Pittsburgh. And to be amongst a group of professional educators who think about, care for, and whose deliberations are intended to make a difference to science education and its future. For instance, and you would recognise this very clearly, what we're talking about here are the nature of our investments in a future generation of teachers and learners, as also influential citizens, uh, public parents and uh, communities. Now, on my first uh, visit to Pittsburgh, um, at a very large conference hosted by the University of Pittsburgh in 1990 it was, I remember having the opportunity to attend presentations on what is a world famous landmark, the Cathedral of Learning. And I was struck then, as I am struck today on my return to this great city, with the generosity of intention and ambition for the building and what its commissioners and architects hope to represent in regard to learning. The Cathedral of Learning was to be more than a schoolhouse. It was to be a symbol of the life that Pittsburgh, through the years, wanted to live. A tower that would be a visible inspiration to all who approached the city. It would carry the message that education was the result of aspiring to great heights. The parallel lines of the truncated Gothic form, never meeting, would imply that learning is uneasy, which is quite an inspirational, um, iconic, architectural uh, feature. Now this building, like the university in the city in which it was located, symbolised the times. A time of turbulence, um, which was the Great Depression, and then one that was followed by great optimism, of wealth creation and investment in industries that would later underpin what the late historian Eric Hobsbawm would come to call the glorious years, which followed the Second World War. These were the years of an unswerving commitment to reason, to progress, and to science, as the basis for modernisation and nation building. And if you've not visited there, do go and take a look for what you'll find are these nationality rooms in the Cathedral of Learning, which are in themselves richly symbolic contributions from the diverse ethnic groups who lived and worked in the city. But they also make a much bigger point of a world at that time explicitly made up of nations whose sovereignty and right to rule over, over its subjects was unquestioned. Governments in the US um, and elsewhere played a key role in investing and expanding access to education from elementary and secondary schooling and later higher education, guided by the view that science, national development and democratic citizen were fundamental for the good society and that a healthy economy uh, depended on these things. Um, and yet there was a balance in my, in my kind of estimation or, uh, or, or kind of judging of that time, is that there was a kind of calibration of the relationship between the idea of a good society and a healthy economy. Yet, to be sure, the lines of cleavage began to reveal themselves in the education sectors um, even at that time as the dynamics associated with race, class, gender, and other forms of differentiation created new forms of stratification. Lines of cleavage were also uh, seen around questions of knowledge, on the relationship between power and knowledge, 
an extent to which Western modernity um, and a paradigm specifically that applied to the West could be called into question uh, around issues of progress and models of development. Now, the period, and this was a period from the 20s right through to the late 60s, that period that I've just referred to. But from the late, from the 1980s, what we see is a very different era begin. Um, and it's an era that has generated uh, many thousands of publications, many thousands of books in bookstores and on library shelves and so on. Um, and it's this very problematic concept called globalisation, which we'll start to look at a little bit closely. But it's a period of time whose change, whose world, the world is actually changing very significantly. Um, and if we compare this world that we're looking at both now in the 1980s, right back to the 1920s, what we see are very significant demographic shifts. So, for instance, in 1925, there were 7 billion, um, oh, sorry, 2 billion in the world. And in 2013, we're facing uh, 7 billion. And what this means also has been with the rise of populations in India and China, there are very uh, specific challenges that that presents in terms of the balance of power around the world. The economic challenges and changes that have occurred, particularly from the 1970s onwards, the collapse of industries that have dominated and driven development uh, in Western economies like the United States and the United Kingdom, which is where I currently am, those processes of deindustrialization and the development of Asia, these have had major changes on our industries and generated uh, uh, major contemplations about where to go forward from here. Um, and clearly one of the contenders that I'll address today has been the development of a knowledge-based economy with huge and really serious implications for where science is located in that policy agenda. The political changes and, and challenges that have been emerged to respond to these economic uh, changes um, have seen the rise of uh, the international bodies, particularly uh, the um, OECD, which is the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, an organisation that was uh, developed after the First World War, but from the 1990s onwards has become very prominent in policy circles. The European Union, again very prominent in the uh, European space, uh, and the World Bank, particularly around low-income countries. But again, uh, these uh, changes in the political landscape um, and the uh, very significant activity of these actors, uh, along with others that I'll mention later, have actually made policy making and policy framing are very different kinds of activities now. We see technological developments, and you'll be very aware of those, uh, internet and so on, uh, particularly also cultural transformations. Um, the end of colonisation has also been added too much later on. And this is the base that are picked up in, in science circles. When I look at the science journals and look at the kinds of things you're talking about, you're also thinking about what the emergence of indigenous knowledge is actually mean for the cultural frames uh, that we've actually used to understand who we are and how we uh, frame our scientific questions and where we go into the future. And finally, and this is where I'll spend some time on, there's been really very uh, big impossible changes as a result of ideological projects. Ideological projects that uh, variously will name themselves as choice, um, neoliberalism, uh, markets, I mean, the, uh, uh, standards, accountability, and so on. So it's this kind of mixture of this uh, kind of grouping, this semantic grouping, has had major impact on education from the bottom to the top, whether we're talking about higher education or we're talking about even the early years learning. Because, of course, even with the early years learners, the idea increasingly is if we can uh, educate them um, at, and these around very specific ways of thinking about uh, themselves as learners. 
but it means that we can, to some extent, neutralise the effects of parents. And uh, increasingly, in some countries, we see you know play and curiosity and creativity being put to the side, and even for very young children, this idea that they would be doing homework, as uh, uh, I see, particularly I teach in Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong parents are very concerned about their two and three year olds doing homework, and I'm horrified at this, this thought. Now, taken together, these uh, impossible developments can be summed up in one word, um, these economic, political, um, demographic shifts and so on, and that is globalisation. Now the question for us today is, what does that mean for science education? What questions should we be posing? What dialogues should we be having, and with whom? Um, and uh, in the earlier conversation with me today, one of the concerns that NAST has is that science educators should be moving into those spaces where policy debates are being um, had, um, and policy framings are uh, very actively underway um, in order to begin a conversation, I think, around the, the nature and form of science education that doesn't chase down this, what I would actually want to argue, and you'll see it in my argument, um, a very, very narrow economistic framing of the possibilities for science education and for scientific literacy. Now, what I think this means then is beginning to question how we at first think about globalisation and to resist ways of talking about globalisation that tends to disguise the actors, the institutions, the discourses and the outcomes. In other words, when someone says globalisation does, uh, what we want to say is, no, 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 actors mobilise discourses around globalisation and they do things. And this is a really important um, uh, move. So what that means, I think, is questioning, uh, for example, globalisation as a, that is a juggernaut that can't be contained, which is the focus of politicians. Globalisation exists off in the stratosphere somewhere, setting uh, in and it's set in opposition to uh, real world deliberations and debates uh, occurring down here, or that globalisation is a radically new phenomenon. So let me take the first one, um, the Jaguar thesis. It was a favourite of uh, someone like Margaret Thatcher that there was no alternative, and this is what the globalisation as Jaguar. Um, uh, motion does. It basically says that these processes that are out there so powerful and with a kind of teleology that you cannot step aside from. Um, and uh, it's, it's to in fact kind of stand you in your tracks and to freeze you there and to make you unable to uh, question uh, what you're actually confronting. In the last to, to globalisation being up in the stratosphere, somewhere in the arc of travel suggested by the Cathedral Spire at the University of Pittsburgh, we need to be very clear that globalisation is found in places, in local spaces. Globalisation is both local and located. Um, and we'll get on to what that means in terms of how we might think about what located globalisation means. What this means, I think, is, um, in, in arguing that it's located, is that it's those uh, agents with the capacity to push their ideas, discourses and projects, uh, or indeed institutional fabrics, out into global space and influence others. So by being located, but actually having some form of spatial projection where ideas are pushed out and to travel through global space, what we then see is the global here and present in our everyday spaces. As this conception of globalisation, the Bob and Tour de Sousa Santos, um, a really important writer of globalisation, argues that it enables some actors or, and their discourses to represent themselves as global and universal and all others in their ambit as local and particular. This way of thinking, for instance, 
Holmes locates Western science and its enlightenment underpinnings as a particular, as it is, and not as a universal. Um, and in, in fact, that's kind of following that same kind of trajectory. Um, it's a Western, largely northern idea uh, that's been pushed out into global space, but it's located and was developed in the metropoles of the, of the North, particularly Europe. In science debates today, we're able to see this particularity, for example, modernity, in the encounters with indigenous knowledges in, and with post-colonial critiques. Um, but we might actually uh, begin to argue that indeed uh, the idea of a knowledge-based economy and a very particular kind of knowledge-based economy is, is located largely in the developed Western economies and is, is actually um, very widely kind of moving uh, out into uh, bits of global space and then landing down in places. Finally, in relation to globalisation as, as a radically new phenomenon, it's actually not. It's a historical process, uh, largely begins in around the 1600s uh, with the growth of capitalism um, and this current period of expansion, I would argue, is linked to that. It's uh, also linked historically with uh, education, which over the last two to three centuries um, has expanded its reach around the globe. Um, it, it gets impetus clearly with the uh, UN's Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 uh, and more recently with the Education for All Agendas um, and the Millennium Development Goals. So education is a global phenomenon that extends back uh, several um, hundred years. Um, but it's also um, an older phenomenon essentially to where we see the kind of disciplinary basis that underpin um, our scientific agendas, uh, sociology, science and so on. These were all disciplines that were largely, in the form that we actually know, uh, largely developed in the metropoles of the, the North and the West um, and then moved themselves outward. Um, but there are mathematical knowledges that were developed in Asia. Some of the first universities, for instance, were, were uh, we found them in China. Uh, one of the universities that uh, 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 I've noted more recently is a very old university in Hanoi, um, formed before the famous university, the University of Bologna. Um, so the, the East has a very long-standing scientific tradition and as we see the rise of the uh, East Asian countries that are becoming also more strident about the knowledges that underpin their own scientific in endeavours. Um, these will generate quite interesting uh, developments as time actually goes on. So let's move to really the substantive issues I want to talk to today around what this means for science education. The encounters uh, with education more generally um, as global processes of work on and through education um, are very deep, they're very complex, but I thought what I'd start with was, was a series of just facts to kind of really set I think, some of the tone of what we're actually facing or confronting. And two of them, um, the first one and two facts that I'll represent here, were reported in the New York Times over the past month. Um, and in, essentially, it's the Merrill Lynch Bank of America estimating the value of education, which they set at 4.3 trillion US dollars. Now, this is not either speculation that if somehow we could actually um, um, sort out the value of the education sector as if maybe in some kind of imaginary future this would be important. This is serious business, okay? It is the business of every business. Who want to be the beneficiaries of this uh, estimated 4.3 trillion? Not students, not teachers. Instead, at the end of the article, three large publishing companies were identified as the beneficiaries of open up education to wholesale and huge scale corporate investors. Pearson Education, um, Elsevier and Informa. Now these are publishers that have largely been in tech book production, but if you take a look at uh, Pearson Education, which is an organisation, uh, uh, one of the, the, the largest uh, global education um, 
publishing firms with a very large education uh, foundation attached to them. They've been very busy uh, developing uh, or supporting the development of uh, small chains uh, that are becoming larger and larger chains of schools, uh, mostly uh, schools in places like India, Pakistan, Ghana and so on. Um, and this is a project that they are supporting in Ghana, uh, the enterprising poor. This child who can't wait to get to school, of the kind of school that the Pearson Foundation are actually supporting. But the kind of curriculum uh, that, this, uh, that these schools, uh, these uh, Amiga schools in Ghana are developing, are actually what are called school in the box. Um, and the, the crucial point I want to draw your attention to here is that when you get corporations that are entering into the development of core business in education, um, the corporations or transnational firms with profit margins. So scaling uh, is really important, um, being able to develop mass forms of production, uh, which is essentially what we see here. Just two other facts here, which really start to make you somewhat concerned about this kind of model of quality delivery is that the teachers who teach these children um, are actually 15 year olds that have just finished high school and they're on one fifth of the range that the Ghanaian teacher in a publicly funded Ghanaian school uh, are then sitting alongside um, these new uh, uh, Omega schools with the school in the box curriculum. Um, children pay on a daily basis and uh, once the uh, monies have not had run out, which is a small voucher, then those children don't turn up in those schools. Now I'm not suggesting that this is the kind of thing that we're seeing in the United States or even indeed uh, in the UK, but what I am actually drawing our attention to is that education is seen to be a huge area for investment. And if you're looking down the barrel of having lost your um, competitive advantage around uh, uh, industries and the production of goods, the entry into the services sector, uh, which is precisely what this is about, is essentially where the sites are being set. And this actually means, uh, I think, serious conversations for educators and science educators for what that means for the kind of knowledge, particularly around science education, which is what you're concerned with. Fact two. Just recently, um, they, the New York Times carried this article, and it was on President Obama's uh, launching in April 2013 of a new $1 million uh, dollar education initiative on brain research in the United States as an ambitious rebuttal to deep cuts in federal financing for science research. However, as the New York Times article observed, what was missing in this account was the backstory that American science, like a source of national power and pride, is increasingly um, subject to being um, part of a private enterprise. Now, as the New York Times noted, in Washington, budget cuts have left the research complex really. Labs are closing, scientists are being laid off, Projects are being put on the shelf, especially in the free willing realm of basic research. Corporate philanthropists are moving in with their own priorities, time scales, and interests. And as policy analyst from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Stephen Edwards noticed, the practice of science in the 21st century is becoming shaped less by national priorities or by peer review groups and more by the particular preferences of individuals with huge amounts of money. Um, and we've seen this particularly in the, uh, the compulsory schooling sector. Um, and I'll give you a few more examples um, shortly when I look at this in, in more depth. But it's essentially the time horizons for investments are much shorter. Um, it's entirely up to the, uh, the interests or the, the uh, um, whether it catches the attention of the philanthropist. And this has to be, despite the money being not welcome, this has to be bad for good science. Um, and if university science labs are not the only space, well, sorry, let me just read that again. And university science labs are not the only space where the corporate philanthropists are having their say. Um, Significantly, and we can see this from a number of the research projects that have been uh, underway in this area, um, they've 
many philanthropists, uh, some of the world's philanthropists like Ford and so and, and Carnegie and so on, have actually, um, not so much Ford, but the new philanthropists are actually moving and putting their money against the policy agenda and not in areas of provision which might have been built up for some kind of discussion about what actually happened to that money and so on. Um, it raises huge issues around public accountability, but very specifically uh, the big issues around power and capacity to influence uh, agendas in largely undemocratic ways. Fact three. In 2011, the first ever international summit on the teaching profession was convened in New York um, by the US Department of Education. And along with that US Department of Education, uh, the OECD and Education International, which is the, 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 the global union that represents teachers and university uh, academics uh, globally. Significantly, the OEC Director of the Indicators and Analysis Division, Andreas Schleicher, who is the architect of the PISA um, studies, and this is Andreas here on, um, on my right, um, I hope he's on the right, but um, in the, the right-hand corner. And this was actually the form um, in the image below that gathered around that table. No teachers were present. And yet this was the first well-publicised uh, convention on, or summit on, on the teaching profession. And Dennis Schleicher played the leading role uh, representing the OECD as framer of the agenda. And that agenda was to build a high-quality teaching profession with lessons from around the world, considered as evidence around issues of teacher recruitment, ongoing learning, professional development, how teachers ought to be evaluated, compensated, and so on. Uh, and this is um, absolutely critical for science education, okay. who's got both a, a major kind of leaky, leaky pipeline to do with science teachers, but also if we kind of drill down a little bit further, um, this very big concern around how do we recruit um, young science students from schools also into universities and so on. But what was particularly disturbing about this summit was the purpose of it and what solutions were being proposed for the reform of education. And so if you actually look at the uh, PISA scores for the United States, what we see is uh, huge concern being generated from the OECD about where the United States ranked on its science scores, on its reading scores, and on its uh, literacy scores. Uh, but in relation to science, indeed it had dropped um, from where it had been. So it has dropped now to being 25th. Um, and this was kind of used as a basis for generating not just major concerns, but actually the movement in, um, into this arena um, on the part of the OECD into the development of now a teacher assessment, a teacher learning assessment tool, which now has been underway for um, since 2008, it reported in 2009, it will report again this year, and this year they will actually have linked uh, these assessments of teachers teaching with the students who are in the PISA classes. So this will be something to work out for. What's important for you to take away from this is that the OECD is their framing policy agenda on teachers who are employed in national and sub-national settings and not engaging in many of these policy discussions with people at the grassroots, with uh, unions, for example, who actually might have rather different views about what the problem is, or even if they indeed, indeed agree on the problem, what the future might be. And it may well not be the kind of uh, range of testing tools that the OECD is developing. PISA, PIEC, which is PISA for development, TALIS, which is for teachers, or HELLO, which is uh, an assessment, a global assessment tool um, for university teachers. So these governing tools, which actually frame policy interventions and policy debates in national and sub-national settings, are hugely important and hugely powerful. So let's just look at what I see as the four big projects at work, which, which reflect or speak back to these tendencies, these uh, 
where some of these tendencies that we see uh, being talked about in terms of uh, these kind of facts, as it were. The first is the development of a brand new competitive knowledge based economy. Okay. And this is the big, big kind of policy talk. Um, we often don't talk about knowledge based societies, which is very problematic. But the crucial thing here for science is that it's viewed as key to this process. For it's science that policymakers hope will generate the new engineers, the ideas, and the innovations that will kickstart a new wave of economic development. And here in the United States, uh, but if you were in the UK and many countries around the world, you would have actually recognised uh, a range of ways in which the problem gets talked about. The race to the top wasn't just simply a policy initiative um, and, and, or an investigation in the United States. Uh, many countries around the world have their own race to the top program. Um, the UK certainly did, and that was launched in 2007, uh, Australia and, and, and so on. Um, so this race to the top as a response to rising above the Babylon storm, which was how it was reported in the United States in 2005, was um, a call for actions amongst federal policy makers to enhance science, the science and technology enterprise so that the United States, but really every other country around the world, indeed, uh, even indeed Europe, um, could engage in the uh, global ways to become uh, globally competitive. What it means essentially is adopting standards, and so these were the uh, recommended initiatives uh, that were subsequently funded, standards and assessments to prepare students to enter and succeed, enter and succeed in college in the workplace and to compete in the global knowledge economy, building data systems that measured student growth and their performance, uh, recruiting, developing and rewarding effective teachers and so on, and, and turning around the most achieving schools. Um, in a series of reports that most recently culminated in the National Academy of Science and Engineering Indicators report in 2014, there was uh, major hand-wringing event taking place that the US had lost uh, or was losing um, its uh, dominance in uh, areas like knowledge and technology uh, intensive industries such as high-tech manufacturing, aircraft, spacecraft, pharmaceuticals, um, other knowledge intensive services such as uh, commercial business, financial and communication services and so on. And this has been challenged by the rise of China. The estimated number of researchers that were needed uh, for the US is then compared with Europe and also with China. And we get these kinds of uh, representations and they are very uh, reminiscent of the late 1950s and the Sputnik era. And while the attention was focused on science, and whilst I recognise also there were investments in science, and there would have been some good things that actually came out of that, that emission between science and the very narrow scientific or science and technology agenda has to be, in my view, bad for this idea that science should have a wider societal remit, that we're looking at major uh, uh, issues around sustainability, we're looking at major issues around climate change, but the big talk uh, agenda is this agenda uh, to do with the competition with China. Um, and when you look closely at this report, it's looking at the uh, a, a range of things like um, the publications, how many publications, and what's the share of publications, what's the share of patents, um, and, and so on. So again, this is a very moral understanding of the role and importance of science um, and technology um, in society. So it's kind of dominated by a techno talk. The growing influence of the multi the multinational um, agencies uh, is also a particular concern. The OECD and the World Bank um, are very influential here, as I've noted. Um, and if you look at the ways in which, uh, again, and this was the uh, National Science Academies, uh, running together the uh, various indicators, um, and I'm, not just, I'm, I'm hoping uh, just that you could take some kind of headline things. If you scan down the right-hand column, you'll see that 
uh, many of the uh, indicators that the National Sciences Academies are using are uh, indicators that are coming from the global agencies, the OECD and uh, the World Bank um, uh, in some cases. Um, now, this again has to be uh, of concern. Uh, the writers who've written on the issues surrounding uh, PISA and, and so on, the writers that are writing on uh, some of the concerns around TALUS. Um, and one of the concerns, particularly around TALUS, uh, and that comes from research that I have been doing, uh, which is this teacher assessment um, uh, system that has been developing, as is that there's a focus uh, very specifically on teachers not having disciplinary knowledge. There's a focus in the, the items that are reported in the, the appendices on constructivism, which I don't have a big issue with at one level because it's opened out the possibility for more inquiry-based approaches. But one of the things that we also know as Sociologists of education is that constructivism doesn't play well with working class children because they need to understand the codes uh, through which uh, you are able to then participate in these inquiry oriented communities. Uh, you might actually ask what the, why the uh, focus on non disciplinary oriented knowledge and uh, my friends who are physicists would tell me that in fact some areas of physics you simply cannot uh, draw an understanding of very complex um, ideas and concepts from your, your local environment. You would need to um, be scaffolded with uh, very uh, uh, sophisticated teachers understanding um, how best to draw children from inquiry-based uh, approaches into an engagement with um, the uh, the, the bases of knowledge that have been building up these disciplinary based knowledge and so on. So these are things that we need to look at because actually once they're in these uh, big testing tools, uh, what they're actually doing is developing a kind of preference for a particular way of thinking about science, the particular way of thinking about what a good science teacher is and so on. The, on the other hand, the, and this is particularly for low income countries, the World Bank has developed its knowledge assessment methodology, and it's very clear we're in a global competition. Okay? There are countries that are located right at the top, which is taking that arc um, up to the right hand corner. Um, but the elements that the, the uh, bank has, uh, which are very similar to the kind of elements that you see in um, most of the repertoire is to do with knowledge-based economies. It's a focus on patents, it's a focus on the number of computers per person, it's a focus on the number of telephones per person, it's a focus on um, world components, so this is actually where uh, if you've got an innovation in one country and um, you patent it, then you're, you're able to take the royalties back across that border and so on. The bigger, more complex, more important science discussions um, are simply absent um, in these kinds of ways of framing. Education as a service sector, I've gestured in that direction with one of the facts that I've presented to you, um, but I want to kind of think about uh, what's at stake and what's at issue here. If education is viewed as a service sector, then that helps us also understand why it is that private equity firms, um, private for profit firms are particularly interested in entering into that sector and looking at how they can take segments of that sector that are financially viable for them. For the private equity firms increasingly these are the platforms, the learning platforms, uh, the testing platforms and so on. For peace of education it's uh, operating in not just textbooks but it's uh, tied, it's linking together its textbook production with learning analytics. Um, and here, um, and uh, some of the MOOC development here, much of that is also about how the firms that are specialising in uh, learning and learning analytics are able to take some of the knowledge that they're generating from MOOC activity um, and particularly, you know, one of the, ch the, the, the learner who's engaged or the student who's engaged in this space, what are they looking at, how long do they look at these things, but 
uh, McGraw Hill, as she goes said around textbooks that they actually encourage uh, university to take in. They gather that information and they then um, have deals with universities about getting the level of performance up to. But moving very closely into kind of the heart of the education enterprise. Now, one of the things we see with for profit firms operating in the higher education system uh, specifically, although in England we have many for profit firms operating in the, uh, the compulsory sector, is that they have their eye on the, the that area um, of activity, um, often it's law, business, social sciences, and so on, which for many universities cross funded scientific activity. Okay, science is very expensive, um, and I know that from my own university. Now, if what you had is um, the university is kind of being left with expensive science and the cheap, the, what seems to be kind of um, particular things are going up, students kind of potentially being encouraged to move into a lot of the kind of provision. What the state, I think, is upset a balance within universities about how scientific endeavour would be funded. And what the state, I think, is leaving uh, universities more open to uh, corporate investments and so on as ways of offsetting um, the rising costs of science. And there are rising costs that science actually face, faces. Finally, if we go to the fourth area we want to look at, which is the corporate philanthropists, who are increasingly targeting their contributions, uh, often in the form of securing tax breaks in areas of policy making and program intervention, in ways that hugely shape the direction of that sector. And I've already made uh, a number of comments um, around that. This is just the obvious ones. I mean, if you look at that huge list um, of firms that are operating. The Gap is a clothing firm, Walmart is a large supermarket. The Lumina Foundation has been a large advisor to the Obama uh, government. Uh, it, it also advises the uh, Europe around higher education. Uh, and, and the Standing Foundation, the Robertson Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates. And then it's a very, very long list here. Um, and those investments are going into the university sector and they're going into the schooling sector. Uh, one initiative that I've looked more closely at more recently is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the uh, one third of the billion that has gone into uh, funding and, and looking at teacher uh, effectiveness and value added measures. Okay, and so these value added measures are looking at what value does that teacher, one teacher, uh, add to the learning of one student in that specific class um, and on the basis of that, um, there is a, a strong tendency in the direction now of looking at using that as, as performance-based pay structures. Uh, the World Bank is promoting this very heavily. It wants a, a, a differential incentive system for teachers. Um, and this, in my view, undercuts uh, seriously the importance of education, particularly in schools and in universities, as the collective knowledge building uh, agendas that are not divisive in terms of who added what kind of value. Um, let alone actually calling into question value added measures which people like Harvey Goldstein and uh, Stephen, Stephen Goddard and so on. This project is, is to be read out across uh, states of the United States. But again, the bigger question here is the extent to which um, the corporate but increasingly the corporate venture philanthropists uh, ought to be operating in, these, uh, in this kind of sector um, in part because what they are looking at developing is uh, a notion of the child as, as an enterprising individual. So it's a very specific uh, approach to thinking about um, education as well. Let me just move to some, some conclusions here. What I want to argue for today is an idea of cognitive justice and the role that that kind of uh, debate and discussion might play in science education. And I want to point to a series of contradictions um, where a more cognitive justice approach would actually be opening up our conversations um, in more significant kinds of ways. I see, from what I've just described to you, um, a sort of monologics at work, 
which are closing down and producing important absences around the things that science educators um, and a science for society and a science for a knowledge society ought to be engaged with. When I kind of scan through the journals that you write for, I've been really struck at the ways in which there's been um, a real uh, engagement with the, the importance of contexts, cont contextually sensitive um, ways of thinking about scientific knowledge uh, that don't give ground in terms of rigor, but actually enable conversations to begin to take place around differences and different cosmologies, different ways of understanding, and what one might learn from each other. So this narrowing, I think, is really problematic. And it's a narrowing that my senses, my hunches, um, you also feel very uncomfortable about. This one size fits all agenda is a focus on just knowledge for the economy. But we live in a society, and that economy has to work for our society, not just for itself. And it's worse than that because it's actually about competition and it's about global competition. And we're being dragged into more or less a kind of contemporary Sputnik era uh, all over again, but this time with China. It turns a particular version of science, a techno applied science, which has to be bad for the bigger scientific uh, endeavors, into the sole criteria of knowledge, uh, which is which is simply not for social well-being, but, it's, it, but it makes that claim that it's for our social well-being. Yet paradoxically, and this is the paradox and the, contra uh, the, 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 the contradiction, and I think those are the things that we can begin to talk to policy makers about. How is it when you want creativity, when you want reflexivity, when you want flexibility, um, and these are all the big kind of discussions uh, that feed into how we develop ideas and innovation. That we have a one size fits all. This is this simply doesn't add up, and you don't have to be a mathematician to figure that one out. The second monologic is this idea that we are all developing um, on some kind of path toward being a knowledge based economy. Okay, and the there's only one direction of travel, as you can see with the World Bank's um, account of this. But even if we take the OECD, there is one account of how we be competitive. Uh, we, we have a particular teacher and particular kinds of students and particular kinds of university uh, lecturers and so on, and they act in uh, a particular kind of way. Now, the contradiction here is that the but the funds of knowledge, which I know is a term that you use in this community, that are available are absolutely placed to the side as having no value, when of course they are the resources for creating not a knowledge economy, but a, a bigger, more generous sense of what it would mean to live in that economy, but in that society, a knowledge society. The third monologic is where we have these top performers um, that are run fair and at the top. Um, and this form of social classification of those winners and then those losers down at the bottom of the hierarchy um, tends to naturalise what are fundamental differences in societies in terms of their economic wealth, their political power, and so on. And the contradiction here is that any true top performer is one who is not just parasitic on that hierarchical difference but is able to see that the differences are the result of their very different access to resources and look at ways in which they develop uh, learning and cooperative relationships with those who are less well off, less well politically placed, um, and less socially uh, or, or more socially marginalised. Um, so, and that would have to be, it seems to me, the kind of uh, language that we would want to use, the kind of policy discourse that we would want to use, um, and the trajectories, the developmental trajectories that we would want to travel on. Monologic form, the global is the bad optic. The balance of the global scale of the local and other scales in turn presents the local as partial, as particular, and as limited. Okay? And those are for some kind of um, 
you know, kind of godly uh, way are able to see all and to have some kind of wisdom um, as a consequence. Yet the contradiction here is that the distance from the local actually matters, and it matters a lot. For it is at the local scale that we are able to see more diversity, more knowledge, more complexity, develop greater degrees of reflexivity, uh, figure out what works for whom, how, and so on. So even on an evidence-based agenda, which is um, one of the ways uh, that we often encounter policy, um, we would see the complexities and the importance of um, different ways of engaging uh, in scientific um, conversations with different scientific traditions and communities and so on. And the fifth monologue here is where we, we prioritise uh, really the market as the only form of productivity. Um, and it's that that's privileged above all. It is that that's given a value above all. And it's this privileging of the growth through the market um, that is made more significant. But think about education enterprises. There's a great deal of a gift economy. When teachers often have been told that they work at the 8 to 5 and the on incentives and so on, this is when they withdraw the goodwill. They don't do things that they otherwise might have uh, given as a gift to the education community. So, and I would say that much of that goes for the, the academy in which I work. There's a huge amount of uh, work that goes on that operates uh, outside of what might, we might call our kind of formal work agenda. Um, but where once we have the dominance of this way of thinking about ourselves and our work, that offers us, I think, a fundamentally uh, diminished way of thinking about the possibilities of knowledge for our societies. So let's draw this now to the conclusion. What we need to do, and I hope we'll do over the course of the uh, days of this conference, is to engage in a set of dialogues around an ecology of knowledges. And where we might have had in the, the uh, cathedral of learning, an ecology of nations, what I'm calling for is this kind of contemporary parallel, which is an ecology of knowledges not necessarily tied to nations because these would have been much more limited um, potentially, but an ecology of knowledge where we take something of the importance of the vision that created the Cathedral of Learning. The various communities uh, in this cathedral there who, community, who, who contributed to the making of the space. And while I do recognise it was a, an elite institution um, and with some communities uh, not recognised at all. It's, it seems to me, nevertheless, can act as at least some kind of metaphor uh, that has a sense of a, a greater ambition and purpose and compass than what we are currently given to navigate um, the economy and society today. Perhaps we can be inspired to actually look at the absences that are being produced in the monologics that are shaping education and ask bigger sets of socially and political minded questions about what kind of education for the 21st century that does not just have a narrow minded economy as its answer. Can we gather in and make, uh, and make use of these diverse knowledges, social experiences and ways of engaging in the world that are there in the science community and I can see them talked about and debated. So I suppose more imaginative questions and insist on more imaginative answers from policy makers. In short, what the polyphony of nations in the Cathedral of Learning tells us is that it is more than the sum of its parts. This tells us that a wider ecology of knowledges, which takes into account greater diversity, experiences, epistemologies, ways of learning, ways of knowing, will always be more than the sum of its parts. It will always be more generous, more socially productive, for it has diversity of ontological and epistemological variety at its centre. Now these ideas must surely be key to our capacity to awaken dialogues on the global, its politics, and our capacity to reimagine and remake our world in ways that are enhanced by the full complement of what I think uh, science has been able to engage with today and can and should take us forward to into the future. Thank you.